Good afternoon, brethren. Please take your Bibles and turn to the book of Ruth, Ruth chapter 1. And Ruth is only a small book with four chapters. Um, So you'll find it after the book of Judges and before 1 Samuel. It's it's wedged between those two books, the book of Judges and 1 Samuel. You'll find the book of Ruth. And I really wanted to teach on the book of Ruth because I wanted to tell a nice story. We've been going through the end times and I've been preaching about the coronavirus, these kinds of things. I wanted something a little bit more lively. Uh, There's a beautiful story here in the book of Ruth. And so I hope to be able to take some great truths from this book. But look at Ruth chapter 1 and verse number 16. Ruth chapter 1 and verse number 16, the Bible reads, And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, nor to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go, and where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God, my God. The title for the sermon this afternoon is, Thy God, my God. Thy God, my God. See, this was the heart of uh, Ruth. She wanted to worship the God of Israel. She wanted her people to be the people of God. And you know, one thing that makes me sad during this lockdown period is that we can't have church. You know, we can't uh, make the people of God, our people as it were, being gathered in in fellowship together, worshipping the true God of the Bible at this point in time. But this was the heart of Ruth. You know, she wanted to be where God was. She wanted to worship God. She wanted to be friends with God's people. And this is why church is so important. And you know, this is why I'm so excited once this lockdown, these restrictions on churches are lifted, it can be gathered once again, so we can worship the God of Ruth, we can worship the God of Israel, but we can also make His people our people. And it's important for us to make friends of God's people. You know, we shouldn't be seeking the friendship of an ungodly world. And you know, you might say, well, our church is small, there aren't many people. Well, are you friends with everybody in our church? Are you, are you striving to make friendships? Are you striving to, to spend time with them and get to know them and to love and to care for them? You know, I know of people that are in big churches of 100, 200, 300 people, and they struggle to make friendships. It's not the size of church. It's whether your heart is right. Is your heart seeking to make friendships, to make the people of God your people? That should be your desire to be in church. Yes, to worship God but also to be gathered with the people of God. And none of us are perfect, I know that, okay? No one's perfect outside of church, no one's perfect inside the church. This is why we come to worship Jesus Christ who was perfect, who did lay his life down for his sheep. But let's pick it up there in Ruth chapter 1, verse number 1. Ruth chapter 1, and verse number 1. The Bible reads, Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. So we pick that up here with the timing of, of, uh, of when this story took place. It says here, Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled. Okay, so we have the book of Judges. Now let's just get the, the timing around here. Of course, Moses would lead the Israelites out of the land of Egypt. Then they would wander in the wilderness for 40 years. And then God will pick them up from the wilderness and bring them into the promised land, the land of Canaan. And as they came into the promised land, they were to defeat the enemies. They were to defeat the, defeat the Canaanites on the land, take that land for themselves. But they didn't finish the job. They left some people, some, some uh, people to live on the land. And this caused them a lot of problems. They had problems with the people of the land in the surrounding nations. And quite often they would fail in their faithfulness toward God. God will allow these nations to come in and conquer them like the Philistines. And God would have to raise up judges like Samson. You know, certain men that would deliver the people out of the hands of their enemies for the power of God. And so, we, so the story takes place here during that time of the judges, but before the kings, before King David, King Saul. You know, when we look at 1 Samuel, which is the book after Ruth, you know, that, that's commonly known as the book which would bring in the kingly line of, of Israel into view, where the people demanded a king. So the book of Ruth takes place before the kingship, you know, the, the kingly line of Israel, and during the time when the judges were overseeing that nation. Okay, and so it also took place when there was a famine, it said there in verse 1, a famine in the land. And this is what drove this man, his wife and his two sons to leave this place and go into Moab. Now, this is the first mistake that uh, they make, this family makes. Look at verse number two. It says, And the name of the man was Amimelech, Elimelech, and the name of his wife Naomi, and the name of his two sons Malon and Chilion, Ephraides of Bethlehem, uh, Bethlehem Judah. And they came into the country of Moab 
and continued there. And so they went to the land of Moab. They went to the Moabites. Now, the Moabites were part of those that were of the land of Canaan. though They were the enemies, as it were, of Israel. But they were led to go there because of the famine. They decided to make the decision, let's leave the land that God gave us. You know, God brought us here, and they went to Moab instead. I mean, that's their big mistake they make in this book. Okay, They left the land that God had told them to go, and they made this man, this, this man made his own decision to leave what God had asked him to do and to go to the land of the Moabites. And, uh, you know, when God tells you to go somewhere, when, when God, you know, shows you what you need to do, where you need to go, it doesn't matter how bad a famine may be. It doesn't matter how many difficulties there might be. God wants you there for a reason. God will use you where he has led you. You know, and, and it's not God's desire that you would run away from his plan even in a time of famine, in a time of hardship. God may very well be allowing that famine to be trying you, to test you, to help you be a greater Christian for his namesake. And so we shouldn't be people that are running around, you know, going to and fro, you know, you know, you know what one, one person may go and start a church somewhere, it doesn't work out, it runs off, starts a church somewhere else, doesn't work, runs off and starts a church somewhere else. Or, you know, you know, these people that say, well, God's leading me here, leading me there, but it seems like it never works out. It's because they're not following the heart of God, they're not following God's direction, they are following after their own heart. They're seeking their own counsel. And they might see a time of famine and say, we need to get away from this famine. But if God sent you there, He wants you there for a reason. And so that should be the first lesson that we see here because this then leads them to the chastisement of God. And God brings great judgment upon this family for leaving where they should have been. And if you don't know who the Moabites are, uh, the Moabites, I'll just read to you a passage in Genesis 19 verse 37. This is when, when Lot, you may remember Lot, uh, left, uh, God destroyed Sodom, Gomorrah. He had to leave. He went to reside in a cave and he was there with his daughters. And it says here in verse number 37, Genesis 19, And the firstborn bare a son and called his name Moab. The same is the father of the Moabites unto this day. And so the Moabites are descendants of this relationship, this, this wicked relationship between uh, Lot and his firstborn daughter. If you know that, we've gone through the series on Genesis. You can go back and, and, uh, and listen to the sermon then if you want the full context of that. But this is where the Moabites come from, okay? Look at verse number 3 in the book of Ruth. Ruth chapter 1, verse number 3. And Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left and her two sons. So, you know, this man brings his family in a place where God did not want them to be, and he loses his life. Now, as we go later on in this chapter, you'll see that this was the judgment of God. Okay? God saw that this man was leading his family in the wrong place, and he passes on. Now his wife and his family, without the number one breadwinner, is left in a land where God never wanted them to be. And fathers, husbands, this is something you need to think about. You know, the decisions you make, you know, the decisions that you have in your heart, you need to consider your family. What if something happens to you? You know, can, is your family going to be taken care of? Is your family in the will of God? If you lead your, lead your family away from the will of God and something happens to you, you pass away, then what's going to happen to your family? You know, you've got to be careful about the decisions you make as the head of your home. Make this, careful about the decisions you make because you might leave your wife in a bad place. And this man was not thinking about the future. He was not thinking that if I lost my life, what would happen to my family? And so, fathers, this is something, husbands, you need to be thinking about when you lead your family. The decisions I make are not just for me, but they have a lasting effect on my wife and my children. You need to keep your family's best interests in mind. You've got to keep your family in the will of God. Look at verse number four. And they, that's the two sons, took them wives in the, of the women of Moab. The name of, of the one was Opa, and the name of the other, Ruth, and they dwelled there about 10 years. Wow. So this famine in the land of Israel, this was obviously a, a significant famine that caused them to leave. But it's not like they came back straight after the famine. They stayed there for 10 years. You know, and if you lead your family away from the will of God, you get away from the will of God, 
It might be a time that you're away from the will of God for 10 years. It could have lasting, long-lasting effects into your life and into your family's life. You've got to be careful to stay in the will of God 10 years. And, they, and the two sons took wives of the women of Moab. You know, the Israelites were instructed to not take wives of these other people. They were to take wives within their own tribes, within their own families, you know, within their own nation, they were to take wives. People that actually worshipped the true God of Israel and these Moabites, they worshipped false gods. Okay, so you can see the, these bad decisions that are made. But we do have the story of Ruth coming here because Ruth was a great woman. Ruth was a woman that left the false gods of her fathers and decided to worship the true God. She made uh, the God of Naomi her God. Okay, the, the God of this family her God. Look at verse number four. Uh, sorry, verse number five. And Malon and Chilion died. That's the two sons. Also, both of them and the women, oh, sorry, and the woman was left of her two sons and her husband. So now this woman, Naomi, not just loses her husband, but she loses her sons. Her sons pass away. Once again, she recognizes that this is the judgment of God. This family had made a bad mistake going to this land, marrying ungodly women, and this was the consequence. God took their life. And, you know, this is, again, something difficult. Some Christians don't understand this, that God can bring judgment. If He sees you in a wicked place, He sees you unfruitful, unable to do anything for His name, unable to work His work, God may very well just end your life like that. That could be His, his judgment because you've become worthless to Him. And we've got to be careful not to get to that point in our lives. This is why we must remain in the will of God. Verse number 6, then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab. And then she heard in the country of Moab how that the Lord had visited his people in giving them bread. Now, brethren, a couple of things I want to bring to your attention here. Notice how the Bible calls uh, the women that her sons married, her daughters-in-law. Okay? Now, marriage is a, a lawful covenant. It is something that is bound by law. Okay? Now, I understand that marriage in our nation has, you know, it, it's trying to be, it's, it, it, there's, there's, a, there's a, people are trying to destroy what marriage is, okay? They've brought in homosexual marriage. They brought in same-sex marriage, okay? And I've heard some people say, well, does that mean then we should not, you know, when, we, when, when Christians get married, should we not seek to have that confirmed by the law of our land? No, no, no. It, it, is, it, is, it is binding by law. Even when it comes to divorce, it's called the bill of divorcement. There's a document, there's a legal document associated with divorce. And that's why it's important that marriage is done legally as well. I, I, you know, yes, there, there are people trying to destroy what marriage is in our nation, but that shouldn't stop the fact that when people get married, they do so lawfully. These are daughters in law. And then it says here uh, that uh, Naomi said, uh, verse number seven, sorry. Oh yeah, sorry. And then it says here that uh, she notices that the Lord had visited his people in giving them bread. Okay, So she wants to go back to the land. She wants to go back to the land of Canaan because she found out news traveled that the Lord was giving them bread, that the Lord was you know, providing their needs. That they had gotten out of the famine. And that was going to be the case anyway. You know, if, 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 they, if this family decided to stay in the land of Canaan, God was going to provide the needs. And God showed them that, yes, Israel was going to be taken care of. You know, that land would, would, bring, would bring forth that milk and honey that they were aware of. God will provide their every need. And now Naomi realizes they're in a bad place. You know, they should have just stayed in the land where they were because God would always have provided. And brethren, once again, this is why we need to stay in the will of God. God will provide our every need. Let's not get out of the will of God and then try to return later, you know, don't make those mistakes. This woman lost her husband. She loses her children. Okay. But look at verse number seven. Wherefore she went out of the place where she was and her two daughters in law with her. And they went on the way to return unto the land of Judah. Now the next verses that we're about to read um, has some really good advice on having a happy in-law relationship. This is a woman with two daughters-in-law. This is a mother-in-law, you know, 
And quite often in this world, we think about you know, mother-in-laws and, and how, they, how, they, how they meddle into the family, in, into the life of her, of her son and in the daughter. You know, there's, a, there's a lot of bad relationships between mother-in-law and daughter-in-law. But what we read about here is a great relationship between mother-in-law and daughters-in-law. You know? A great relationship between Naomi and the, the wives of her sons. And so I want to take some good principles that we can apply you know, if you are having rocky relationships with your in-laws, then well, let's take the lesson that we see here in why they had a good relationship. Look at verse number 8. And Naomi said unto her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you, as ye have dealt with the dead and with me. So she says, look, go back. There's nothing I can do for you. You better go back to, to your uh, mother's house. And the Lord will deal kindly with you the same way you dealt kindly with the dead. That's, you know, their husbands and with me. Okay. So the first thing that we notice about this relationship between mother-in-law and daughter-in-law is that there was kindness in this relationship. You know, the daughter-in-laws, even though their husbands had died, were dealing kindly with their mother-in-law to deal kindly. You know, the definition of kindness is to be friendly, generous and considerate. Friendly, generous, and considerate. You know, you're being mindful of your in-laws. And you know, when I married my wife, you know, what I should do is to show kindness to my in-laws. My wife, she should show kindness to my parents. Now look, it's not for my parents or her, for her parents. It's not for the in-laws to meddle in people's lives in the new family unit that's been created out of marriage. But rather, we should consider them. We should think of them and be kind toward them, to be friendly, to be generous toward them. This would help maintain a close friendship, close rela relationship, a good relationship, I should say. You know, I, I don't know what it is. I mean, I've never had to marry off any of my kids just yet, but it's going to happen one day, right? God willing. And uh, I, I'm assuming, especially for the mother, it's very hard to let go of her children. You know, the children that she's given birth to, she, she had great grief and sorrow to bring forth that child. And then that child gets married, you know, leaves the family home, starts a new family. I think it must be difficult for mothers to let go. And because it's hard to let go, they want to meddle. They want to be involved in that person's life. But no, the Bible says that a man should leave father and mother and cleave unto his wife. And, and they twain shall be one flesh. And so marriage is leaving that family unit creating a new family you know and in-laws you know father-in-laws mother-in-laws you need to understand this you need to let go of your children when they get married let them have that new family unit don't meddle in their affairs but we should have good friendship we should fellowship that is still your family your extended family you know your, uh, and and that hut that that man that married your daughter you know he's part of your family now that's your daughter's husband or if it's your son you know that's your son's wife. You should show kindness toward them. Look at verse number nine. The Lord grant you that ye may find rest, each of you in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voice and wept. So notice verse number nine. Naomi realizes that, look, you go, and then she goes, uh, you may, that you may find rest, each of you in the house of her husband. You see, she realized you're going to go back and you need to get remarried. You need to go and find a new husband. Okay? She's ready to let go of them. She honors each house, that each of those daughters will, may, may very find new husbands. They would have new families. And they're saying, you've got to find rest in the house of your husband. Now, if you've married off your daughter, you need to tell your daughter, go find rest in the house of your husband. That's their house. And of course, the Bible uses the term house interchangeably with family. Okay? So when someone gets married, that's a new house, that's a new family. That's not part of your family anymore. That's a brand new family when you let go of your children to marriage. And of course, the Bible uses that word, like I said, family interchangeably. Just for example, in Genesis chapter 7, verse 1, when Noah built the ark, what does God say to Noah? He says, And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark. For thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. And so God tells Noah, look, take your house into the ark. Now, of course, God's not talking about the bricks and mortar of a house. You know, how we use the term house today. He's talking about those that reside in his house. Those that are of his household. 
And so he was to take, of course, we saw his wife, his sons and their wives onto the ark with him. That was his house. That was his family. The Bible also says in Psalm 113 verse 9, the Bible says, He maketh the barren woman to keep house. Okay, what does that mean, to keep house? Is it she's vacuuming, she's, she's uh, uh, dusting, she's, she's mopping the, you know, the building? No, no. A joy, you know, it says here, a woman to keep house and to be a joyful mother of children. Praise ye the Lord. That's where we get the term the housekeeper from. You know, we talk about a wife who was a housekeeper. It's not that she, you know, she uh, fixes a broken down house. It's not like she's going and building a new veranda, okay, or that she's putting new tiles on the roof. No, when she's keeping the house, she's looking after the household. She's looking after the children, the husband, the family that God has given her. And of course, one of the most famous passages that we love to turn to when we're given the gospel, Acts chapter 16, verse 30, and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Asked the Philippian jailer. Verse number 31, And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. And then the next words, And thy house. Your house can also be saved if they believe on Jesus Christ, is what they're saying. What's the house? Well, in verse number 32, it says, And they spake unto him the word of the Lord, and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of that night and washed their stripes and was baptized. He and all his straight away. So the Philippian jailer believes and then he's baptized the same night. He and all his, his entire family believed on Christ. His entire family were baptized straight away. And in verse number 34, and when he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. So I like verse number 34 because it covers house in two ways there. It says, and when he brought them into his house, so that's where he lived, that's where he reside, he set meat before them and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. So it's not like the, the building believed in God. It's not like the building believes on Jesus, but his household, his family, his servants, whoever it was that made up his house, they all believed on Jesus Christ and were baptized. And also, if you look at Ruth chapter 1, verse number 9, not only do we see that uh, Naomi honoured each house, and that's important, okay, if you want to maintain good relationship between mother-in-law and daughter-in-law, is honour each house, you know? Understand, that is a separate family. Don't go and meddle in someone else's affairs. And, you know, if you're a man, you need to make sure you take care of your wife. It's not your mother. You don't go and, and, and prioritize your mother and father. You prioritize your wife. You prioritize the family that God has given you. You know, you want to be a provider for that family. You know, you're not to run to mom and dad for help. You are the man of the house. You are the one to lead that home. So she recognizes that, Naomi. And then it says at the end of verse number nine, then she kissed them and they lifted up their voice and wept. And so the third point that I had, you know, for, to maintain good in-law relationships, number one was to be kind, kindness. Number two was to honor each house. And number three is show affection. And here we see Naomi kissing her daughter-in-laws. Not only did they, they kiss, but they lift up their voice and they wept. They wept. You know, they wept to, uh, because they were, there was going to be this separation, right? The separation. They were going to go back to their old families. And so we see affection between the in-laws. And here, again, it was by a kiss, okay? And this can be a hug. You know, nothing wrong with kissing and hugging your in-laws, showing them affection. But if that's not your style, I know, you know, especially in Australia, uh, some Western culture, it's not common to, to show physical affection to people like that, like your in-laws. And so, you know, you can show affection some other ways. You know, a gift, you know, giving your in-laws gifts from time to time, showing them that you care for them, showing them that you have affection for them, okay? This is how you're going to maintain solid in-law relationships, okay? Kindness, honoring each house as separate individual houses, and number three, showing affection one toward another. Look at verse number 10. And they said unto her, Surely we will return with thee unto thy people. And Naomi said, Turn again, my daughters. Why will ye go with me? Are there yet any more sons in my womb, that they may be your husbands? Turn again, my daughters. Go your way, for I am too old to have an husband. If I should say I have hope, if I should have an husband also tonight, 
and, also, and should also bear sons, would ye tarry for them till they were grown? Would ye stay for them from having husbands? Nay, my daughters, for it grieveth me much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord is gone out against me. And so here we have Naomi recognizing the fact that God's hand has been put against her and against the family. This is why she lost her husband, her sons. And she's saying, look, you might as well leave. I can't have any more children. It's not like I can have more sons. They can grow up and marry you. So well, that's a bit weird. Well, keep your finger then. Go to the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 25. Because Naomi is speaking about a law that was passed with the law of Moses in the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 25 and verse 5. Deuteronomy chapter 25 and verse 5. And this was a law that God gave. It says here in verse number 5, If brethren dwell together, that's two brothers that, that grew up, that lived together in the same household, and one of them die and have no child, the wife of the dead shall not marry without unto a stranger. Her husband's brother shall go in unto her and take her to him to wife and perform the duty of an husband's brother unto her. And so... If a woman were to marry a man and that man were to pass away and she were to have no children, then by law, the brother of that man that passed away was to take that woman as a wife. Okay? That was one way that God put in place for that woman's needs to be taken care of okay? and for her to have children through that brother. And then in verse number 6 it says, And, and it shall be that the firstborn which she beareth shall succeed in the name of his brother which is dead, that his name be not put out of Israel. So the firstborn in that new relationship would be considered a son of that first brother. Verse number seven, and if the man like not to take his brother's wife, so if you said, look, I don't want to take my sister-in-law as, as my wife, you know, after my, my brother had died, well, this, there was an option as well. You didn't have to, okay? This was God's plan. This was God's desire for the people of Israel to do this. But you could also have, you know, this is an arranged marriage you could opt out of that, okay? And this is what we read about here in verse number seven. And if the man like not to take his brother's wife, then let his brother's wife go up to the gates of the elders and say, my husband's brother refuseth to, to raise up unto his brother a, man, a, a name in Israel. He will not perform the duty of my husband's brother. Then the elders of his city shall call him and speak unto him. And if he shall stand to it and say, I will not to take her, I like to, sorry, I like not to take her, then shall his brother's wife come unto him in the presence of the elders and loose his shoe from off his foot and spit in his face and shall answer and say, so shall it be done unto that man that will not build up his brother's house. And his name shall be called in Israel, the house of him that hath his lo shoe loosed. Okay, so a bit of a strange thing and obviously something that we're not very familiar, not, not common at all in our day and age, not common at all, not done at all in Australia is if a man desired to not take that sister-in-law as a wife, that he would kind of be brought to shame, uh, that he would not carry out his duty. But then once, you know, that sister-in-law would spit in his face and she would be loosened off his foot, foot and be ashamed, then he could go about and marry whoever he wished. Okay, so it was an optional thing, but the right thing to do at this point in time was to take that uh, sister-in-law as his wife. Now, the situation we have with Naomi is that she had no other sons. Both sons had died, okay? And she's saying to them, look, are you hanging around just so I could have more children? She goes, look, I'm too old. I'm too old to get married. I'm too old to have more children. And even if I could get married, even if I could have children, are you going to wait for that child to grow up? You know, let's say they're 20 years old at this point, 25 years old, let's just say, 25 years old. You know, are you going to wait for this guy, this young man, you know, if I were able to give birth, you know, to grow up, to be, say, be 20 years of age where he can provide for you and then get married. I mean, you'll be like 45 at that point in time, right, of age. So, you know, uh, Naomi is just showing that it's pointless. Why are you here? There's nothing I can provide for you. There's nothing I can give you. I can't give you a husband. You might as well go back to your land and find a husband for yourself in your, uh, in your land. And then look at verse number 14. Ruth chapter 1, verse 14. And they lifted up their voice and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clave unto her. So <clears throat> or, or, you know, Orpah is ready to leave, but Ruth wants to stay. Verse number 15. And she said, Behold, thy sister-in-law is gone back unto her people and unto her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. So you can see once again that these women were not 
uh, people, uh, believers of the God of Israel. You know, maybe they were now, I'm not sure, but when they were married to the, to the sons, they had their false gods that they worshipped. And so she went back, Orpah did, to her land, back to her false gods. And then it's verse number 16. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go, and where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. These are amazing words that Ruth spoke. These are words that are, are repeated very often in the Bible. And she desired that the God of Israel would be her God. She did not want to go back to the false gods. She knew the true God. She knew that this was the God that she would worship. This would be the God that she would serve. This would be the God that could provide her salvation. And uh, again, this term, thy people shall be my people and thy God my God, this comes from uh, uh, the book of Leviticus. I'll read it to you in Leviticus chapter 26, verse 11. And it's my personal belief that Ruth knew of these writings. Of course, these were the writings of Moses. She must have learnt this from her husband or from her mother-in-law. And, and she, was, she was aware of what she was saying. Because in Leviticus 26, verse 11, God says, And I will set my tabernacle among you, and my soul shall not abhor you, and I will walk among you, and will be your God, and ye shall be my people. These are the words of God. He says, I will be your God, and ye shall be my people. And this is, of course, you know, uh, God entering into this covenant with the people of Israel. And uh, Ruth wanted to enter into that same covenant. She wanted to make the, that God, the God of Israel, her God, and the people of Israel, her people. You know, and this is such a great heart. You know, she wanted to be with the Christians. She wanted to be with the believers. She wanted to be with the people of God. And this phrase appears six times in the book of Jeremiah alone. I'll just read a portion to you. Maybe you can keep your finger there and you can go to 2 Corinthians for me. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And I'll just read to you from Jeremiah 24, verse 4. It says, Again, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, Like those good figs, so will I acknowledge them that are carried away captive of Judah, whom I have sent out of this place into the land of the Chaldeans for their good. For I will set mine eyes upon them for good, and I will bring them again to this land, and I will build them and not pull them down. I will plant them and not pluck them up, and I will give them a heart to know me that I am the, the Lord and they shall be my people and I will be their God for they shall return unto me with their whole heart. So not only did God say these words when he established a covenant with the Israelites, but also when the people of Judah would be taken into captivity, God would speak about those that would return back to the land of Canaan, once again reaffirming the fact that he will be their God and they will be his people. And you've gone to 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse number 15. Now in the days of the New Testament. And the Bible says here in verse number 15, 2 Corinthians 6, 15, And what concord have Christ with Belial? Or what part have he that believeth with an infidel? So the Bible's saying here, look, what... what what could there possibly be in common with Christ and Belial? That's a name for the devil. What could you possibly find in common with someone that believes with someone that is an infidel? An infidel is someone that doesn't believe. What can you find in common? Okay, Verse number 16. And what agreement have the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. So you see, God says of us in the New Testament that he will be our God and we will be his people, of course, by believing on Jesus Christ. Not by following false gods, not by having idols in our life, but by setting Christ as our Savior, by believing on his sacrifice. Look at verse 17. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And so let's bring this back to Ruth. You know, Naomi's saying, look, go back to your lands, to your false gods like your, your, like your sister-in-law has. And Ruth says, no, what, 
what is there in common? What, what can I possibly find in common with this false religion, with these false gods? No, I want to make your God my God. I want to make the God of Israel my God. These things cannot go together. And so that's what I love about verse number 17 in 2 Corinthians 6, 17. This is the heart of Ruth. You know, God says, wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate. Ruth chose to be separate from unbelievers, to be separate from the false gods. She decided to worship the true God of Israel. Back to Ruth chapter 1. Ruth chapter 1, verse 17. Ruth chapter 1, verse 17. Ruth says, Where thou diest, will I die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and, and uh, more also, if ought not but death part thee and me. When she saw that she was steadfastly minded to go with her, then she left speaking unto her. So they two went until they came to Bethlehem. And it came to pass, when they were come to Bethlehem, that all the city was moved about them, and they said, is this Naomi? You know, is this Naomi? So they come back to Bethlehem. They come back to the city where Naomi was originally from. And you'll soon see that, well, that 10 years had passed. 10 years had passed from when they left for, for the famine and they were coming back to, the, to Bethlehem. 10 years had passed. Look at verse number 20. And she, and she said unto them, Call me not Naomi, call me Mara. Or Mera, for the Almighty have dealt very bitterly with me. So, verse number 21, I went out full, and the Lord have brought me home again empty. Why then call ye me Naomi, seeing the Lord have testified against me, and the Almighty hath afflicted me? So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law with her, which returned out of the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem in the beginning of barley harvest. So Naomi says, look, you know, people recognize it. <clears throat> they say, well, is this Naomi? <clears throat> it's been 10 years. We haven't seen her for 10 years. Is this her? Obviously, she's aged. Probably wondering, where's your husband? Where are your sons? She comes back with this woman that they've never known, uh, Ruth. And she again acknowledges that God had judged her, that God had judged her family. And she says, look, don't call me Naomi. Call me Mayra. Okay. And it said there, for the Almighty have dealt very bitterly with me. And that's what Mara means, or Mara means. It means bitter. Okay, and she realizes God has been bitter toward her. God has judged her severely. She has lost her husband. She has lost her sons. And she comes back. She, had, she was full. She had everything she needed when they left. But now she comes back empty. You know, she comes back with a broken, bitter heart. And so, you know, if you look at... Um, if you can, uh, sorry, go to, uh, keep your finger there and go to Exodus 15. Go to Exodus, Exodus 15 for me. Because as, as I had mentioned earlier, you know, God had put laws in place for the people of Israel not to marry, not to intermarry with the people of Canaan. You know, God said that they will turn your hearts away from the true God. And they had gone, they had left the land that God had promised them. They had married, intermarried other people with false gods. And of course, God came and brought heavy, bitter judgment upon Naomi. Now you're turning to Exodus 15, verse 22. Exodus 15, verse 22. And, you know, if you feel that God has judged you, if you feel that God has judged you bitterly, if maybe you have bitterness in your heart, because of a situation. I want you to really focus on what we're about to read in Exodus 15. Because we can all suffer bitterness. And bitterness is such a, a terrible sin. It destroys you. You know, if someone has done wrong against you, you, you may feel bitter toward them. But your bitterness toward them has no effect on them. They're going about life as per usual. Your bitterness is tearing you apart. Okay? And if you've been judged to some extent with bitterness from God, or you have that, that bitterness in you, then take heed to the next words in Exodus chapter 15, verse 22. And this follows on from, of course, Moses leading the Israelites out of Egypt. And it says in verse number 22, So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea, and they went out into the wilderness of Shur. And they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. So God leads them to a place, it's dry, there's no water. But then look at verse number 23. 
And when they came to Mara, now there's that word Mara, okay, that's where the word bitterness comes from. Let's keep going. When they came to Mara, they could not drink of the waters of Mara, for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Mara. So they're thirsty, they're looking for water, they finally find some water, they drink of it. Oh, this is bitter. This is disgusting. There's something wrong with this water. That's why they call that place Mara. Verse 24. And the people murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And he cried unto the Lord. That's Moses. He cries to the Lord. And the Lord showed him a tree, which when he, cast, when, when he had cast into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made for them a statute and an ordinance, and there he proved them. Proved, that's why he tested them. Okay? If you're going through bitterness, if you're being judged bitterly, this is a moment for you to be proved. God is testing you. God is trying you. God is seeing how are you going to respond to this bitterness. And so the people of, of Israel started to murmur. God instructed Moses to take this tree and cast it into those bitter waters. And those bitter waters became sweet. It was drinkable. There was nothing wrong with the water anymore. It, was, it, was, it tasted refreshing, beautiful, sweet water. Okay, say, so what was in that tree? That's not the point. Okay, the point, that's a supernatural thing. You can't take bitter water and throw a tree at it and it's just going to be fixed. Okay, this was something that God did, a miracle, this was supernatural. The point is, if you're suffering with bitterness, if you feel the hand of God has been bitter against you, you need to go to God. You need to cry unto the Lord the way Moses cried unto the Lord. And the Lord can perform a miracle. The Lord can take that bitterness out of your life. Okay, he will bring something like a tree. He will bring something in your life to help you find comfort, to heal the bitterness that you have. Please don't be a bitter person. Don't let bitterness eat you up. It will destroy you. Run to the Lord and ask him for deliverance from bitterness. Look at verse number 26. And said, if that will diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God and will do that which is right in his sight, and will give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes. I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians. For I am the Lord that healeth thee. You see, God, he healed those bitter waters. God can heal you if you're bitter in heart. Okay? But what should you strive to do? What did God ask you to do? He says, give ear to his commandments. Hearken to the voice of God. Listen to God. Keep his statutes. So God will not deal with you bitterly. You know, God will not bring the diseases upon you the way he brought diseases upon the Egyptians. Okay? So if things are bitter in your life, run to God. Do what God asks you to do and he can lift that bitterness from you. God can heal you. All right? Reverend, that's, the, that's Ruth chapter 1. I hope there's been some benefit for you to go through those passages. And we're going to, obviously next week, go through Ruth chapter 2. And uh, brethren, once again, you know, church is where we should desire to be. Unfortunately, at this time, we can't be here. But I hope you're getting excited. I hope you're longing to be once again with the people of God so we can worship the true God once again. And brethren, if there's bitterness in your life, run to God. Ask Him for the cure that He may heal you from that bitterness. God bless.